welcome to Science Studio. Uh, we're actually at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography today in La Jolla, California. Um, the Scripps Nirenberg Prize was awarded last night to our guest, Richard Dawkins. Richard is a well-known evolutionary biologist, um, just finished as Charles Simoni Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford, and a well-known author, obviously, of books from The Selfish Gene through The Blind Watchmaker to The God Delusion, and his new book, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. But welcome, Richard. Thank you. New book is called? The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. It was supposed to be called Evolution, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Only Game in Town, which was a slogan on a T-shirt that somebody sent me, but the publishers wouldn't go for the second part, so it's limited to The Greatest Show on Earth. All right. Now, I mentioned we're at Scripps. Um, the former director of Scripps and the half of the, the prize name that you got, William Nirenberg, Bill Nirenberg, was also a great communicator of science. And I'm just thinking that you're in great company in winning this prize. If you look at the list of the, the folks who got it, um, I'm just checking now. It's uh, E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson. Pretty good list. David yeah. Attenborough. Um, uh, Jane Lubchenco, who's now the administrator of NOAA. Uh, Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, Craig Venter, um, James Hansen. Mm -hmm. Two climate people in there, incidentally. Uh, and we are at a place where a lot of the original work has been done that contributes to the whole global warming issue. This is slightly a curve for you, but um, only in the sense that global warming is one of the important issues in science and social policy at this point. And we have now an administration where the president has said that um, he wants to restore science to its rightful place on the U.S. agenda, and a leader of the House um, who says that her agenda can be expressed in four words, science, 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 and science. Would you, can we just lead off by some comment on the whole nation, the state of science relationship to policy? And I'm delighted that, uh, that we now do have an administration that takes science seriously, treats science with respect, and uh, it's about time. I mean, we've had four years science has been in the wilderness for four years, uh, for eight years indeed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, so that's extremely welcome. On the matter of uh, global warming, and it's obviously an extremely important issue, it's one that's very hard for lay people to evaluate. It's a very complicated, involves complicated model building uh, and lots of different experts in, involved in their different spheres. That does make it hard because it means that to some extent we who are not versed in the details have to take on trust what experts tell us, and that's always risky. It's not what scientists like to do, I and mean, they like to sort of evaluate it for themselves. But inevitably, scientists in one field have to say, well, we trust our colleagues in, the, in other fields to be getting their sums right and doing their modeling right and things. Um, but that does make it a little bit awkward. It, mean, it means that I'm, I'm not being a climatologist. I don't feel able to speak with the same authority that I could speak with in, say, evolutionary biology. Yeah. We, we, we sort of had a conversation about this uh, a few days ago at, in, in Arizona at the Origins Initiative. The, the, this, this dichotomy between, on the one hand, a public that would like to have a definitive answer to things and thinks that, and thinks that that's what science delivers, and the reality of science. Um, in communicating, in, in your job as um, Simone professor, did you find that that was one of the issues that you had to be constantly... Yeah, yes, it, it, it is difficult. I mean, uh, and, and the way I put it is that I'm, I'm not qualified to tell you anything about physics. Uh, I'm pro probably qualified to interrogate a physicist and to pose interesting questions to a physicist, but I can't speak with any authority on, on physics. And I suppose that a layperson who doesn't know any science at all um, does tend to think, well, I, I need to get an authoritative opinion on everything. I need to know, is this true or isn't it true? And they don't take kindly. Politicians don't take kindly uh, to being told, well, it's, well, sir, it's a bit uncertain. Some people think this, some people think that. The evidence isn't yet all in. Um, but the, un unfortunately, that's the reality of the world. Did people make that argument to you when you when you got into the God business? I mean, what do you know about that? <laughs> well, they did, but I mean, I, I'm less impressed with that because the, because the, although there is a subject called theology, which when you have professors of theology, I mean, there are some professors of theology who do interesting things like studying ancient um, documents, I mean, Hebrew documents and things, and others who study um, history of biblical lands. But theology itself, the study of God, the study of 
the trinity or the transubstantiation, that seems to me not to be a subject where you can legitimately call yourself an authority. There is nothing there to be an authority on. And therefore, I don't feel impressed by the argument when it's, when it's applied to me there. Yeah. Let's come back to that in, in a moment and circle around to it. C can we just go back to, very quickly, um, beginnings, you were, you, your family, was there a scientific, um, religious background? Um, what? Born in? I, my father uh, read botany at Oxford. I read zoology at Oxford. So we had similar educational backgrounds. Uh, he was, still is, um, very keen on nature and wildflowers and things taught my sister and me the, the names of flowers. My mother, too, was knowledgeable about that. I suppose uh, I therefore had a sort of scientific background, not a religious background at home, uh, a religious background at school. I was sent to an ordinary Church of England schools and was made to go to chapel every Sunday and got confirmed when did, did the whole thing as, as, a, as a boy. As I mean, that's a fairly typically English story because the, and, yeah. and my my understand my memory is that that um, the requirement for there being RI as it was known religious instruction in schools was in fact part of a suggestion put forward by T H Huxley of all people when he was r running the London. I, I wasn't aware of that, but yeah. I'm not totally surprised because yeah. uh, it does seem to me to be educationally valuable that children should be taught about religion which I imagine was Huxley's idea. Yeah. Uh, if you teach children about religion, as opposed to teaching them a particular religion, you don't teach them, you shouldn't teach them such and such is true about the world, about God. You should teach them, there are people called Christians who believe this, and there are people called Muslims who believe that, and people called Hindus who believe the other. Um, and the implication then is, and, and you can look them over and make your choice, or, or, or indeed decide to choose none of them. I think that a proper program of education in comparative religion would sound the death knell of religion uh, probably even more surely than a proper education in science, and I'm all for both. One of the questions after your lecture last night, this is the same point, essentially said, look, um, I'm a Christian, I w would like to impart Christian values to my children. Um, what right do you have to dictate to me that I shouldn't do that? And, and your response was to say, in fact, that you weren't dictating to mm -hmm. him, but that you thought that he ought to offer the opportunity to his children. Exactly. To... Yes. I mean, uh, um, it's, what, it's one thing to talk about the rights of a parent to, to teach their children whatever they like, uh, but what about the rights of, of children? Um, we already accept the principle that, that there are certain things parents do not have a right to do to their children. They can't. Um, beat them black and blue, um, um, they can't knock their teeth out, they can't um, be cruel to them. The, the state even steps in and takes children away when that happens. I'm not advocating that in the case of religious indoctrination, but at least that shows that, that we accept the principle that parents don't have an absolute right over their children, and children are people too. They have a right to learn, to be exposed to um, all that humanity has to offer, which includes science. And if there are parents who deliberately uh, deprive their children of the opportunity to learn all the wonderful things we now know about the world, then that is a serious deprivation. I think that's a form of child abuse. And uh, I, I'm not necessarily advocating that the state should step in and force the parents to educate them properly. But um, it, it, it's certainly worth thinking about. Going back to this, uh Childhood. You, you actually grew up in, in Kenya, in Kenya. Well, no. Um, I, I was there for two years, two and years. then it's moved exactly to. Up no, there. that's right. And then <laughs> moved to Malawi, which was where my that was then Nyasaland, which was where my father's ah. career was, and th so that I do remember, and uh, um, have been back there. That's you know, just sort of further down, and, and it's a similar country, but um, uh, rather poorer, uh, rather well populated. Well, let me check something with you, because one reads the background, the stories can often be wrong. Um, it sounds as though there was already, a, a, you know, your father's influence would possibly send you in the scientific direction. You're growing up in an interesting area, naturalistically. Mm -hmm. um, but I read that, in fact, you weren't particularly interested in, as, as, a, as a boy in the naturalist Well, that's side. true. I mean, when I was at, um, um, when, when I look at my fellow students who are reading zoology, yeah. If you ask them how most of them got into it, uh, many of them would have been bird watchers or 
bug hunters or butterfly collectors mm -hmm. or, or, or wildflower kind pressers. Darwin and Wallace types. Uh, yes, Darwin and Wallace types. Com compared with them, I was more interested in the the sort of questions of existence, the, the contributions that biology can make to, I suppose, philosophy. Uh, it's not that I w was positively anti-natural history. I just wasn't quite so. I'm not. I'm, I'm not a good natural historian, but I'm probably, you know, a bit a bit above average. But but I'm far below the average of of professional zoologists, who are nearly all better naturalists than I am. So so this intrigues me because you you were interested in the why questions, which. As your lecture last night, you were basically saying, look, we do the how stuff very well. The why stuff, um, that's, that's... No, I think we tricky. do the why stuff pretty well. At least, if anybody does, does the why questions, we do. I mean, I think my main point would be wh why questions are either Ill illegitimate questions, like what is the color of jealousy? That's an illegitimate question. Um, uh, to the extent that why questions have an answer at all, science is, is going to be the one the subject that finds them, and certainly theology isn't. I mean, there, there, there aren't any, any rivals to answer why questions. Um, was there some pivotal point that made you decide to go and actually do science at university? Was there a teacher? Um, I suppose at the age of about 15 or 16, in the school system which I and I think you were in, yeah. you had to make a a choice. You, you couldn't both do science and do, say, history. Uh, and uh, I more or less drifted into biology. Um, it was, uh, I, I wouldn't say I was wildly interested in it. I was sort of, I wasn't that good at school and I, I was sort of more interested in biology than in, than in anything else. And so it was a kind of drifting in, partly perhaps my father's influence. I didn't really become deeply fascinated by it until, ooh, my second year at university. And there was something that... It was the subject itself, I think, um, aided by the tutorial system, which is unique to Oxford and Cambridge, right. where, where you, um, instead of being lectured to and then going to practical classes and sort of having to meet a required standard in, in exams in which it was assumed that there was a body of knowledge that you had to learn. The, the essence of the tutorials, at least that I experienced with Oxford tutors, was that you were given an essay each week, which was often on a controversial topic, which you were supposed to uh, come up with a, with a view on, having, having devoted the entire week to going into the library and reading up all the original literature, all the original research papers in the original journals on this topic. So this is a very heady experience for mm -hmm. a 19-year-old to be, in effect, as near, as near to a world authority as you could become um, in a week. <laughs> and you probably ended up knowing more about it than your tutor in certain cases, uh -huh. because although he had spent time reading it up, he wasn't so up to date because you'd just been in the library for that week learning it right. up, and not learning it, reading it, digesting it, um, sleeping, dreaming it in, in, in some cases, including mine. Um, so when I came to write the essay, I was kind of temporarily obsessed with this subject. It was coming out of my ears. Um, that's a very unusual experience. It's totally different from the experience of a student who says, oh, I'm taking biology 213 or whatever it mm -hmm. is, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking genetics, and so I'm learning the requirement to pass the exam in genetics. It wasn't like that at all. It was, it was write an essay on the controversy between Fisher and Wright on, on um, uh, um, genetic drift. Mm -hmm. and, and so you would read the original papers and, and, it, and evaluate it as a scholar. I, I found, um, don't want to sound like, complaining about the difficulties of the modern system, but, but um, I, I, d I have found in, in talking to, to classes of students recently that one of the things that seems to be missing enormously is history of science. Yes. So there's no context for, for what they're doing. Um, d is that sort of the point you're making as well? Not quite. I mean, it, that's a, that would be another way of making the same point, I, th I think, uh, but, but, but it, it's a different point. I, I'm not one who thinks that for every question you need to go back to the Greeks and, right, and right. Um, you know, start with Aristotle and things. I, I find that nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't, usually doesn't help you very much. Right. So 
There's a big turning point. You, you go to Berkeley at some point, right? You, you graduate from Oxford. At some point, you go to I, Berkeley. I went to Berkeley as a very young assistant professor uh, at the age of about 26. Um, and this was my first job. It was very exciting, uh, totally new place. Um, I mean, you know, something like where we are now. Yeah. And um, intellectually exciting, politically exciting. It was, a very, it was a very tempestuous time in American politics. This was the Lyndon Johnson years. This was the Vietnam War protest years. Um, and Berkeley was in, in the thick of it. And um, so it was, a, it was a, a, an interesting time. And, and I only stayed there two years and then was, I suppose, lured back to Oxford by a wonderful offer I couldn't refuse. Hmm. How does how does the selfish um, the selfish gene is really the thing that's that you're associated with a great deal? Although I think you prefer the book the book that followed it, the extended phenotype. But selfish gene came out in 1976. Yes. Um, what was the stimulus for that? Where did you get the idea? What was going well, on? Well, um, my own research wasn't on evolution, but it, my much of my preoccupation as an undergraduate writing essays had been on evolution, and I never lost that interest. Um, there was a spate of popular books in the, uh, in the 1960s and early 70s uh, which committed what I regarded as the grave fallacy of group selectionism in explaining the very important question of, of altruism, co cooperation, and, the, and how, that, how that evolves. And I wanted to write a book to explain what I thought was the correct interpretation of Darwinian natural selection, the level of the gene. Um, I'd started lecturing on this topic in, in Oxford, actually, before I went to Berkeley. Uh, I stood in for Nico Tinbergen when he went on sabbatical. And I was at that time very excited by the papers of W.D. Hamilton on what's called kin selection, and which kind of became the centerpiece of the selfish gene 10 years later. Um, and so I based several of my lectures to the Oxford students on, on Hamilton. And then when I went to Berkeley, I did the same thing. And um, then went back to Oxford and carried on with my research, which was nothing to do with any of this. Then there was a power strike. There was a, um, a thing called the three-day week, which was, which was under, in the time of Grocer Heath's um, prime ministership. Prime Minister Edward Heath. Yes, right. that's right. Um, and th at the height of the, of the crisis, um, th there was um, the electricity was completely cut off for great swathes of time every, every week, so I couldn't do my lab research. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, now's the time to write this book that I've been <laughs> um, nurturing. And so I, I wrote, I think, one chapter, which was pretty much the first chapter of The Selfish Gene, in about 1972. Um, what presumably one can look up when, when the three-day week was. It might have been yeah. 73, I can't remember. Um, and then the, the strike was over, and the electricity came back on, and so I dropped it and just put it away in a drawer. And then I got a sabbatical leave in 1975, specifically to finish the book. And by that time, there was more than just Hamilton on the scene. There was Trivers, there was Maynard Smith, mm -hmm. and so um, I, I put it into a, what I think was a fairly coherent view of natural selection, at the level of the gene, as opposed to the level of the individual, and certainly as opposed to the level of the group, uh, and um, published it in 1976. Okay, there's a full circle here, and obviously, it's getting into too much too much depth would be would be difficult. But um, I remember Bob Trivers, who I, I think wrote the introduction, the yes. foreword to the self yes. gene. Um, talking to Bob about how he went through this kind of a transformation himself, sitting there trying to figure out whether kin selection, a la Hamilton, yes. or group selection, Vera Win Edwards' version of things, was the, was the more accurate, and going back and forth, back and forth, mm. finally having a sort of a revelatory experience and deciding that, that he was going to go with the, the kin selection mm -hmm. idea. We are now 30 some years on, having gone through the sociobiology mm -hmm. phase of E.O. Wilson yes. and so on. And now Ed himself, E.O. Wilson himself, David Sloan Wilson, uh, are espousing a kind of groups, a return to group selection. Um, d do you want to comment? Does that strike you? I think they're that? just confused. I mean, yeah. I mean it, you, 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 you rightly cite Wynne Win Edwards for, for group selection. That was the group selection that we destroyed. Uh, and it, it 
various other mechanisms which, which really work at a, at a genetic level. Um, the so-called new group selection is just kin selection or in some cases reciprocal altruism under another name. For reasons best known to himself, which I can't understand, D.S. Wilson thinks it's helpful to rephrase it in terms of group selection. How it can be helpful when he's reviving a word which has been debunked and simply grafting that word onto the very thing that did the debunking, namely kin selection and reciprocal altruism and various other things. Uh, it seems to me to be utterly unhelpful, to be totally misleading to students, and deeply, it's deeply regrettable that E.O. Wilson um, should have teamed up with him in this way. Do you think that one of the reasons for this, that, that uh, underpinning some of this is, is a deep revulsion that some people still have at the um, the rather harsh aspects that come to morality and so on if you're espousing a completely kin selection view. I have too much respect for E.O. Wilson to suggest that he would be motivated by that kind of kind of reasoning. I, I mean, it may be. I, I'm sure that I'm sure you're right for for, for certain people, but. Um, Science, after all, is science. It, it's, it's the science of what's true. It's the study of, what, of what's true, and it doesn't matter if it's disagreeable. It doesn't actually have to be disagreeable, because um, the, the fact is that humans are, in many cases, nice and loving and cooperative, and we, and, and we, we don't have to obey. Uh, we don't have to behave in a, in a ruthless way. I mean, the, the, the main message of the selfish gene, actually, was that genes may be selfish. They have to be selfish. That's sort of almost part of definition. Of, of how natural selection works. But in the course of, of selfish genes acting in order to promote their self-interest through the generations, they may very well program altruistic behavior at the level of the individual, um, as I mentioned, kin selection, re re reciprocation, and so on. And um, those are robust theories. They work, uh, and um, they can be generalized sort of by the cuckoo principle that, that sometimes um, mistakes are made mm -hmm. so that altruism which originally was selected in, in, in humans during a time when kin relations were very important generalize to uh, people in general. So that's why we give money to Oxfam and, and, and feel empathy towards people who are suffering and so on. Um, we, we, we can devise a perfectly good theory which frees us from the need to feel all pessimistic about, uh, about human nature. But even if it didn't free us from the need to be pessimistic about human nature, um, fretting about human nature is no reason to change our science. Science is, is, is the science of, of the truth. I, I noticed, I made some notes last night from the lecture that you gave. Let me just take, take a quick look. You were talking, in fact, about some of the things that we now do are subversions of the original yes. machinery, in a sense, so that um, we have goal subversions, and subversions mm. of parental care mm. would be the, the liking mm. for pets mm. and so on, or subversion yeah. of... Yes. Well, subversion, that's what I meant by the cuckoo principle. Um, sub subversion is, is the way out of feeling pessimistic about all these things. I mean, we are, we are a highly subverted species. We are, uh, we, if we, even, even if our ancestors were selfish and ruthless, I mean, even they didn't have to be because of the um, kin selection, etc. But we are highly subverted, so we actually can be, many of us are, really rather nice. But perhaps I should, before leaving, <laughs> perhaps before leaving the Ed Wilson thing, I should say, um, I mean, he, he's talking specifically about, about ants, which he, of course, knows better than anybody, um, and is sort of tempted to say um, he wants to reintroduce a kind of group selection because he's looking comparatively at what it is that led to certain groups of insects becoming eusocial and, and others not, and is saying that um, you can't get a good handle on explaining which groups went social by thinking purely in terms of um, the coefficient of, of relationship, um, the, the um, fraction of, of genes held in, in common between, between individuals. Um, therefore, he's looking for other things. I have no problem with that, whatever. I mean, that's still covered by Hamilton's rule, because Hamilton's rule says that a gene will spread if RB is greater than C, if, if the benefit devalued by the coefficient of relationship is greater than the cost. And, and you've got, you mustn't forget B and C. And of course, B and C are very important. 
benefit and cost. These are economic variables which are very important, interacting with coefficient of, of, of relationship. But you can't get away from it when you're trying to explain, as Darwin did, uh, things like how can worker adaptations enhance the huge jaws of, of soldiers or the, um, the flat head, front of the heads of, of trapdoor ants? I mean, these are worker, ca worker characteristics which are not present in reproductives, and yet they're passed on from generation to generation, even though the individuals that manifest these these qualities are, are, all, are all sterile. The only way to explain that is the way Darwin explained it. And it is, it is indeed kin selection. Darwin didn't, didn't say that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the, the same genes express themselves differently in different individuals. They express themselves in workers as massive jaws or as flat fronts to the head. They, and they express themselves in queens or males in other ways. Um, but the gene in a queen is favored because the queen, because copies of the same gene in reproductives, in young queens and young males, is protected by the massive jaws which mm -hmm. are made by the same gene in the soldiers. Mm -hmm. That's not group selection, that's gene selection. The whole thing is gene selection. Everything in Darwinism is gene selection. And it's just unhelpful and confusing for somebody as influential as Ed Wilson to suddenly turn around and say he started thinking about group selection again. What's he thinking of? It's confusing the issue like this. Hmm. Um, tell me something, since you just mentioned Bill Hamilton, um, would you like to just say a little bit about who Bill Hamilton was? Uh, yes, um, he was an English uh, biologist um, who was uh, a great entomologist. He was a, he was a a very um, deeply thoughtful, reflective man, I think rather like Darwin in that, in that respect. Um, he uh, has been called by some people Darwin's greatest successor of the 20th century. That's disputable. Um, but, I mean, Fisher would be another candidate for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say Hamilton was Darwin's greatest successor in the second half of the 20th century. Um, he uh, looked at selection from a genetic point of view. He always asked himself the question, how would a gene improve its survival chances by acting in various ways? Um, and he, so he pretty much laid out the, the whole theory of kin selection, but lots of other things as well. I mean, he made major contributions to the theory of sex ratios, to the theory of, to the introdu introduction of game theory into um, evolutionary biology, into the theory of evolution of sex, mm -hmm. why we have sex, sexual selection. He was an immensely fertile mind, constantly throwing off ideas which he would bury deep in paragraphs in other papers. You had to sort of you know, ferret your way through them. I was once having a conversation with him about the evolution of eusociality, true social behavior, in termites. Um, which are rather different from ants, bees, and, and wasps. And he um, was praising the theory of, um, I, I forget the name, the, um, I, I'll, I'll just say X. X's theory of the evolution of ter termites. And I said, but Bill, that's not X's theory, that's your theory. You, you proposed that seven years ago in, in, in your paper in, um, I forget, you know, I mentioned some journal. Um, and he said, no, that was X's theory. So I said, no, it wasn't. And I ran to the library, which was just close by, <laughs> fetched the relevant book, opened it, and said, look, it's your theory. And he looked at it, and he said, oh, yes, it does appear to be my theory after all. <laughs> but X expressed it better, he said. <laughs> so he, was, he, was, um, he had this sort of personality, which uh, you being English will, will know about Winnie the Pooh. And, and, right. Uh, um, uh, he was Eeyore. Eeyore, right, he was, absolutely. He, was, he had this sort of lugubrious <laughs> melancholy. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, he was a dear man. Uh, he was um, uh, devoted to science and to truth. It led yeah. him into all sorts of difficulties. Uh, he, was, he felt himself to be undervalued as a student, which he was. Uh, he, he was sitting on that. His, his PhD thesis in London was... 
was among the most important contributions to evolutionary theory of the late 20th century, the second half of the 20th century. Um, it was un unappreciated at the time, more or less ignored at the time. And I think he felt um, done down by this. He sort of felt not exactly bitter, but I think under, undervalued. He was immensely valued later in life. I mean, he, yeah. he, he died um, celebrated justly and, and um, loaded with, 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 with honors. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking about somebody else about the same period, just, just to close this, because there's, there's a different response. That, you know, obviously, there was George Price. Oh, yes. Another story. George Price, who played an instrumental role yes. in some of the equations yes. that were used to describe the inclusive yes. fitness, the kinship, yes. and so on, who took his own life yes. because it was such a depressing view, allegedly. Yeah, I, I never met George Price. Um, I, I, I mean, Bill Hamilton and John Maynard Smith were both close friends of mine and, and knew him well. Um, it, 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 it does appear he was, he was very mentally unstable, and, and, it, and the story does seem to be true that he took his own life. Uh, because he was so depressed by the implications of evolution for human morality. Um, it seems to me a curious sort of reasoning because it's quite clear that we don't, as a matter of fact, follow Darwinian dictates um, slavishly the way he might have feared. Um, but he, I mean, there are all sorts of stories told about him, and I suppose I think they're true because they, they were told me by people who knew him well. Um, he, he took literally the injunction to sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, and he, and he became completely poverty-stricken, I mean, sort of dressed in rags and yeah. sleeping in doorways and things because he gave everything away. Um, and Maynard Smith's story is that when they wrote the, what actually was, I think, the first paper on game theory as an explanation for um, less than all-out aggression, the game theory explanation for um, uh, moderated combat. Um, they had a model which was called hawks and doves. Well, actually, there were other things: hawks, doves, bullies, and, and other, other things. Um, but but s during the course of developing this this paper, um, Price became so fanatically religious that he wouldn't use the word dove because he thought it was a sin against the Holy Ghost. And so, in that first paper, dove was actually changed to mouse. It was was hawk and mouse. Wow. Uh, and um, later Maynard Smith restored it to Dove, and that's the way we, we now know it. It's, it's become known in throughout the hawks literature doves. as Hawks and Doves. Yeah. Um, it, it, how do you explain this thing? I, I, I noticed that, that, I mean, interviews that have been done with you, many of them, but they, they have a common thread. Yeah. Um, and I've known you for a while, so it's, it's I'm just curious to know how you respond to this. That, I mean, here's one. I feel uneasy approaching Richard Dawkins' house in Oxford. The strange thing about reading his latest book, this was The Devil's Chaplain particularly, is that I agree with virtually everything he says, but find myself wanting to smack him for his intolerance. Mm. I, well, I, I'm not the best person to... <laughs> I mean, um, I think there's a difference between arguing robustly against somebody and being intolerant of them. I mean, yeah. I, I, um, I, I guess... In, intolerance is refusing to listen or not bothering to argue because you just sort of simply think they're beyond the pale. I suppose I occasionally do that, but who doesn't when you're faced with some of the provocation which one occasionally gets? Yeah. Um, but if somebody is honestly interested in working together to get at the truth, if, if they're ignorant, and we're all ignorant of something, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're ignorant of most things. Um, I'm very, very happy to have a discussion with anybody, which I hope is, is amicable. I think if, they're, um, if, if I feel that somebody is wantonly and deliberately deceiving mm. uh, because they've got some sort of agenda, I might be intolerant of, of that. And I, I Maynard Smith, whom I greatly admire, who was, who was extremely good with, with students, with, um, with anybody who genuinely wanted to know, I've seen him go red with anger. Uh, at a creationist who he's, he's, he, dict he detected, he caught out in, in using deceptive tactics to mislead students. I suppose I'm a bit like that. Do, I mean, what, doesn't, don't you f f sort of get 
up to here at some point with um, why do you keep on talking to these folks because it, it, well, it, I don't it must usually be talk to I, mean, I, I, what, the, I talk to people who, who genuinely want to know who genuinely want to discuss and and discover and and I mean y y last night at the at the right. um, at the uh, Nirenberg le lecture um, as, as it they're quite unusual actually a, a, a gang turned up I mean a a, a, a clique. They, they filed in in single file with Bibles under their arms, all sat in a row, and then when it came for question time and people were asked to queue up behind a microphone, um, they just all, one after another, I mean, they, were, they completely monopolized the, the, um, right. the microphone. Um, that was unusual. And I usually try to answer um, uh, robustly, but I hope courteously. I, I think I did Lose, lose it one, once last night when the, the, the Hitler-Stalin question came up, which I've just had so many times. It's such a stupid question, and yet over and over and over again they trot it out. Oh, the, um, the, the false... Logic. I mean, so, you know, Hit, Hitler and Stalin did their terrible deeds in the name of secular humanism. Yeah. I mean... Because they were atheists. Yeah, well, Stalin was, Hitler probably wasn't, but, but, but anyway, it's irrelevant. They, they didn't... They didn't do it in the name of secular humanism, and there is no possibility of doing it in the name of secular humanism. Why would you? I mean, how could you logically derive violence and killing from secular humanism? You easily could derive it from Nazism, which Hitler did, or indeed from certain religions, as we know only too well today. Mm. The, the, the campaign on the English buses, could you... Speak it's a bit of a joke. I mean, it, 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 was, um, it was started by um, a young them. woman called Ariane Sherin, um, who uh, was provoked by pro-religious bus advertisements. I, I think they said something like, if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll go to hell or something like that. And so she wanted to run a counter campaign, which was much gentler than that. She, her campaign said, there's probably no God now something like stop fretting and enjoy your life or something like that. Mm -hmm. So she wrote, a, she put a piece, I think it was on the Guardian website, um, appealing for money to, to pay for a campaign of advertisements on buses. And she, needed, she knew she needed 5,500 pounds to get 30 buses for one month. And she actually got, I think, 100,000 pounds in two days, almost all from small subscriptions. Before I knew about all these small sub subscriptions coming in, I, I agreed with her that I would put up um, a matching grant of five thousand five hundred pounds, um, which would mean that if everybody matched, if, if it was matched, we get eleven thousand um, pounds. And in the event I needn't have bothered, I mean, it, it, the, the money just poured in: mm -hmm. ten pounds here, five pounds there, fifteen pounds there. Um, it was a spectacular success, a popular, a genuinely popular movement. I'm now rather regretting I made my matching offer because, because it wasn't necessary. And, and um, um, it's not that I begrudge the money, it's just, it's just that I would have li I'd have liked to be able to say this was a purely grassroots campaign, which it almost all was. Yeah. Um, there's, there's one, uh, there's a, um, I, I don't remember the exact reference now, but isn't there um, um, an edict against uh, uh, your website, your Richard Dawkins dot net. Uh, in Turkey. In the Turkish y yes. people have been told not to um, go there. Yes. Um, it seems that there's an odd loophole in Turkish law such that if any citizen goes to the authorities and complains about a, a website, it's instantly closed down while they investigate it. I think that's the way it works. Yeah. Uh, you'd think they leave it open while they investigate it. But, it's, <laughs> but, but um, so the, it, 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 was, it was achieved by this, this really dreadful man, Harun Yahya, whose real name is Adnan Oktar. Um, he's the, this, he looks like a sort of James Bond villain. I mean, you, you look, look, him up on, do, look him up on Google Image and you see this extraordinary figure on, on a yacht with a sort of you know, glass of champagne or something, maybe he, he total, I don't know, um, with a white suit uh, and, and um, looking just like the sort of villain of a, of a James Bond film. Um, I think he's in and out of prison all the time. Um, he's certainly under suspicion of all sorts of terrible things. And he's the one who wrote this astonishingly big, fat, coffee table book. Oh, the one that was sent which, around? Which sent round, sent round free to all. That means there's a colossal amount of money there because this is a very, very high quality 
production, not high quality content, but high quality production book with glossy pictures. Um, at, at least, the, I, I, I don't suppose any, he's paid any copyright fees for any of those pictures. I mean, there's no acknowledgement of any copyright. I imagine they've all been just ripped off. Um, but it, it is a very expensive book to produce. It's been sent around free. It's full of elementary zoological howlers. I mean, the, the theme, every page of the book has a, um, has a fossil, and then it has a modern animal. And the fossil might be 200 million years old, and there's a modern animal, and the message is, see, they're just the same. So evolution hasn't happened. In a few cases, they are just the same, but there are, which means that you know, evolution does sometimes slow down. I mean, there are living fossils. But there are other cases where they're nothing like each other. I mean, there's, there's a case where the, where the fossil is a crinoid, a, a, sea, a sea lily, an echinoderm, a sort of stalked sea urchin. Um, and the modern animal that's pictured very clearly beside it is not an echinoderm at all. It's a, it's a sabellid worm. It's a, it's a tube-dwelling annelid worm. You couldn't get more different if you tried <laughs> and still remain an animal. I mean, these are different major sub-kingdoms of the, of the animal kingdom. There's another one which has a fossil eel, and then the modern so-called eel, which is a, it's a snake. It's a water snake. It's, it's this common water snake you see if you dive almost anywhere in, in the tropics, the one with, with um, st stripes acro across. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, but the champion one of all is that there's a caddis fly in amber as the, as the fossil. And the modern so-called caddis is not an insect at all. It's a, it's a fishing fly, an <laughs> artificial fishing fly with a hook sticking out of its backside. <laughs> That's actually been removed from the latest edition of the book. He must have been so embarrassed by it. Um, and, and he's now trying to pretend it was never there. Um, but, but, it, but, they, but, but there it is, and there are numerous other, other such, such howlers. OK, so what, I mean, why, one question would be, why don't uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so, so called, that, that's you, Sam Harris, Chris Hitchens, Dan Denning. Yeah. Um, why not just sort of say, <sighs> This is so silly, and just let it go, um, because it's, it's been quite clear from some of the tone, and I've spoken to Sam obviously about this, and we've done the Beyond Relief mm -hmm. meetings, as you know, that, that at least what appeared to be part of the strategy was to say, um, we have to take a full offensive to, to the whole notion of people who are subscribing to a religious point of view, and that even uh, that moderates, even just people who just like going to church, like singing the songs, mm -hmm. like the architecture, mm -hmm. like the music, um, have to be shaken out of their... Um... Well, yes. Um, strategy is, is an optimistic word to use. I mean, there, there was no strategy, as far as I'm aware. Um, we certainly never discussed anything. Uh, uh, um, and I don't really think I had a strategy. One can sort of, with hindsight, invent what might have been a strategy. Um, and it's not a bad one when you think about it. I mean, being, being nice hasn't worked for decades. Right. Uh, and in, independently, without any coll collusion, uh, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Dan Dennis, and I, in our different ways, came out rather more. Well, Dan actually was rather more gentle, I think, than the other three of us. Um, and I think that we probably have had an influence, which the nice, our nice predecessors, manifestly failed to do. Um, so uh, I think it's nice to be nice, and, and that, that, that there are other people who, who adopt that policy. But I think there's also room for uh, people like um, Sam and Christopher and me. A little in your face. Yeah. yeah. In, in a good-humored way. I mean, <laughs> um, we're often accused of being sh shrill and strident and things, and those are nearly always, um, th those, those adjectives have become so ubiquitous that they almost can't see our name written down by a religious person without being preceded by that. I actually think, um, uh, I mean, I like to think that The God Delusion is actually quite a funny book. I mean, it's, I think it's, it, it, it should make you laugh. It, it's certainly not strident. What about the, th the, the, the people who criticize the theology and the so on and so forth? I mean, that, that wasn't... Well, I, as I said before, I, I don't think theology is a subject at all. Um, so, I mean, the, one, one should no more be criticized for n neglecting theology than one should be criticized for neglecting fairyology when you say you don't believe in fairies or for, or for um, neglecting 
astrology when you when you want to say that you're an astronomer and you don't take astrology se seriously you don't actually need to learn up the niceties of the study of fairies in order to say you don't believe in them it's if somebody wants to believe in fairies the onus is on them to produce some evidence that they exist and the same goes for god okay so so what you what what's your current position then for the i mean today happens to be first day of passover Next week, it's going to be Easter Sunday. There's going to be droves of people engaged in what you would say is a non-subject, non essentially. Well, I mean, you yourself said there are people who enjoy singing the songs and, and, and enjoy ritual and things, and I'm, I have no problem with that. Yeah. Uh, this, is a, this is a nice book that you probably know, Angels and Ages by Adam Gopnik, which is a, a oh, sort of his Darwin know. and Lincoln book. And he has yes. some... It's a, it's a wonderful book about Darwin as well, but he, he also makes the point, and I'm just using him as an example, um, even if we mean by religion what most people have actually meant by it since the beginning of time, an encompassing practice of irrational rituals that can't be justified, but only experienced and given order and continuity to of life, then of course religion is compatible with Darwinism. Because in a sense, it's the epiphenomena of religion, the choral music, the stained yeah. glass, the communion, mm. are the thing itself. Yes. It's kind of... Well, yes, but then it's trivial, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's just like, you know, you enjoy music, that's fine. It's, uh, but I mean, religion, for most people, does make actual existence claims. It actually does make claims on the universe. Uh, and um, th that's where I have problems with it. Right. That's one of the one of the many places I have problems with it. But but, so you you're not you don't have a problem with people, because the, the the sense that one had of this, in hindsight, was there a campaign and a strategy was that the people who did go and sing the songs and go to the church and so on, um, were somehow aiding and abetting the people who fly well, into and knock over buildings. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I I don't think that going to church and singing the, singing the hymns does, does that. I do think that, that's a, that there is a sort of aiding and abetting in people who say things like, um, uh, if you have faith, then you can be justified in playing out that faith. I mean, it, it's somehow treating the idea that faith is a, is a virtue. There is no virtue in believing in something uh, because of private revelation or because of tradition or because of um, because some authority figure tells you, or, or because you just simply have faith in it, because you've been brought up with it, say. Um, that's not a good reason to believe anything. And if you, if you teach children that that is a good reason to believe something, then you are aiding and abetting, because then if they believe on faith grounds, on revelation grounds, that it's the right thing to do to be a suicide bomber or something, we, we don't have an argument against them. They can simply say, oh, that's my faith. You can't touch that. You can't argue against it. I don't have to justify it. Faith is, is, is enough. I think there is an aiding and abetting element there from those people who are themselves moderate, but who preach the idea that faith is a good reason to believe something. So what do you do? I mean, with the, the people who were there last night, for example, I mean, is the, you could certainly argue with the person who said, I'm bringing my children up as, as Christians and so on and so forth, but... Um, well, the, the, those people would have been unreachable, but there could have been lots of other people who hadn't really given it very much thought and who assumed, well, I might as well bring them up Christian, everybody else does, you know, but it doesn't seem to have done me any harm. It, uh, you, 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 that, you might give such people second thoughts. Um, if you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have liked to have been? Um, as a child, I was obsessed with music and with all musical instruments. I, I gravitated towards it. If there was a musical instrument in the room anywhere, I'd gravitate towards it. Um, and, um, but I never practiced hard enough to become a good but musician. But do you play something now? N no, I mean, I, I, I can. I, I, I've, got a, I've got a natural ear for music which is the, of the kind, it's, it's melodic, not harmonic, it's the kind that um, if, if I can whistle a tune, I can play it on, on, an, on, on an instrument without thinking any harder than I think about how to whistle it practically. But that's not necessarily a virtue if it leads you, as it did in my case, to neglect the hard graft of, of practicing. It, it was so easy for me to just use my melodic ear to play that I never bothered to learn to read music and so, so I'm, I'm no good at it. Um, 
then I became, at various times in my life, I'd be, been obsessed with computer programming. And re that really is a vice, that's an addiction, which I've shaken off for the moment. Uh, but I think I could easily have imagined a career doing that. I remember ages ago when we were at Caltech, you were then working diligently on those... Um, yes, that's right. Computer programs. Yes, yeah. I was, yes. I, I spent a fortnight in the... Apple Computer had a, had a little branch office in Los Angeles, and yeah. I, um, I, I worked there every day. It was one of the most productive fortnights of my life, I think, um, yeah. surrounded by expert programmers whom I could ask for their expert advice. But you no longer make your own no, I don't. slides no. and stuff. Um, if you, any, anywhere in history, but not Darwin, this is because that's too obvious an answer, I mean, who would you have liked to have had a conversation with? And you can say oh. Darwin if you wish. Uh, um, well, I'd be quite curious to have a conversation with Jesus, actually. Um, it would be very interesting to hear what really happened. But I expect he'd have just been a fairly ordinary sort of contemporary equivalent of a hippie. Um, uh, it probably wouldn't have actually got much out of him. I don't know. I haven't read the book yet, because it's not actually out, but Robert Wright, of course, who wrote The Moral Animal and then Non Zero, mm. has a book coming out called The Evolution of God. Yes. And there was an excerpt in, in The Atlantic, and it's, uh, it, it deals a lot with Paul and Paul's yes. um, globalization yes. efforts. I mean, you, you know this argument and so on? Uh, I, I, I haven't read the book, no. No. Uh, it's not, you do say it's, it, when's it coming out? I think June, a couple yes, of months okay. from now. So. Mm. Um, do you have the sense that it, that, that, um, it was an, a, an enterprise? That Paul, is, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've always, Im I've always uh, understood that, that Christianity is pretty much Paul's invention. I had an ancient history, Histor uh, ancient history colleague in, in New College, a very distinguished ancient historian, whose lifelong quest it was to discover who was the greatest shit of all time, Plato or St. Paul, and he could never decide the answer. <laughs> what, what would be the argument against St. Paul? I don't know. The, Plato was even worse, I suppose. I don't know. Mm. So, um, the, the current global situation financially, um, Couple of, uh, last week, David Brooks wrote a column in the New York Times in which he discussed the, whether this was stupidity or, or greed. And both of these things are, are approachable from a neuroeconomics perspective. In other words, you can, you can start looking at these from a more scientific perspective. You, you, and, and you could even bring in some cooperation, trust issues, and so on and so forth. So a lot of these things can be addressed with, with some of the science that's beginning to be developed. Um, do you think that that will ever happen in terms of the, 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 the way in which societies are held together currently by, by religious forces? I do feel very diffident about venturing into a field so far from my own. It might surprise some people. Um, <laughs> I, I, I actually am not arrogant enough to, to to venture an opinion on economics, certainly not on the current economic crisis, whether it's greed or stupidity. I, I haven't any idea. Right. Um, on the more general question of whether a scientific approach to economic decision making it would be valuable, I can't believe it wouldn't be. I mean, I, I can't imagine that it would ever do any harm to try to investigate such things scientifically. But it's way beyond my expertise. So, all right, but after, after God, then what? I mean, what, what, do, you have a, do you have a particular topic in mind for, 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 to, to work well, on next? Well, um, I, my plan after this book is finished, The Greatest Show on Earth is finished, to, is to write a children's book uh, on science and on uh, how, to, how we know about what's, what is scientifically true and to contrast it with myths. Uh, my idea is to... Um, to to, to contrast a, a mythological view of each question in turn. Um, you know, what is man, what is the sun, what is, how old is the earth, it, yeah. it's who was the first person, and so on. Um, and to, uh, to show that myths are interesting and, and poetic and, and, and fascinating, um, to, to, to sort of lose the Judeo-Christian myth in the middle of a lot of other myths, so that to show there's nothing special about it, and then to come on to the scientific answer,
to whatever the question is. So it'd be a series of questions, beginning with mythological answers and then going on to the scientific answer. The children thing comes up a lot. I mean, one of the most vigorous things you've ever written, and, and one of the things that I see you react to m most strongly, is, is encapsulated in, in Letter to Juliet, yes. which is the letter to your daughter. Yes. I mean, was this was this a, a sense of of her being disenfranchised or something? What was what was? Yes, I I um, I think that I I, I didn't want to indoctrinate her, um, and never did. Uh, but she was how old at the time? Ten. Sorry, ten. I ten. wanted to um, to 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 show her the power of critical thinking, to show her that there were. There were good reasons for believing things and bad reasons for believing things. And the good reasons for believing things have all got to do with evidence. And it's not easy to filter out the evidence, but I was trying to encourage all children, when they're told anything, to think about uh, what might be the evidence for the thing that they're being told and to be suspicious of anybody who tells them something which cannot be backed up by evidence. Were you success? What is she doing now? She's a, she's a, a, a trainee doctor. She's a, she's a medical student and, and doing very well. And not going to church every Sunday? No. <laughs> right. Um, who's the smartest person you've ever met, do you think? And who's the wisest? Are these questions you ask everybody? Yes, they are. I'm sorry. It's a bit OK. Um, and occasionally I get some interesting answers. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed to answer that because I um, I sort of feel it's it would be unwise Selective. of me to, to when all the people that I've met I mean I've met you know yeah. close colleagues that I've known for years and talked to on a daily basis for some periods of my life who I might think of as the smartest person I've ever met but then I've also met um, you know Nobel Prize winners for five minutes and right. and um, and so I, I think I, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to pass on that. Okay. Um, are you surprised that um, th there's still this enormously vigorous response from people about the the God delusion? I mean, um, well, uh, there are there are responses, positive and negative. Right. Um, but I mean, uh, it's, big, it's been the biggest seller of your books, right? Yes. Uh, well, like the selfish gene has had 30 years to sell in and, and still sells very well every right, year. Right, so right. it's possible the total sales are greater. In fact, I think they probably are. Uh, but it's the, certainly the fastest selling of my books, yes. Uh, the God Delusion is. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's um, <laughs> perhaps it's rather a good book. I don't know. Yeah. Are you, uh, is there any discovery that you wish you'd had made, or are you are you happy that uh, with the ex I mean the extended phenotype you always describe as being your best piece um, of work? I mean, well, uh, I'm sure there is. Yes, I mean, I, 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 there are many discoveries that I admire, and and um, uh, but but you know, I, I wouldn't really aspire to have made them. Yeah. So. Next year we, is the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society. Yes, um, it's a, a, an opportunity, as we've discussed, to talk about the sort of fact that we're living in a world that Francis Bacon essentially predicted mm -hmm. and, and described to some extent, um, and the the um, the traders on his mythical island in the New Atlantis. If you remember, they they they. The commodity that they dealt with was light, the light of understanding. So in a sense, mer uh, scientists could be described as merchants of light. And we have a 350-year enterprise going on at least, although there was this scientific revolution leading up to that and so on. W how do you think it's done so far? I think it's magnificent. Uh, I mean, in it, I hardly need say that in my own field of, of biology, uh, it's been transformed first by Darwin and then by uh, the, the, every, all the whole of biology since, which has been which has been underpinned by the Darwinian idea, culminating in the second half of the 20th century with the molecular genetics revolution, which is just spectacular. I mean, the idea that you turn genetics into a branch of highly uh, accurate digital information technology—Darwin would have loved it. But also in physics, I mean, um, the 
the, the progress of, of physics since the start of the Royal Society, spectacular as well. Um, with, with, with Maxwell and Faraday and Maxwell and Newton and, and Einstein and um, um, the quantum theory revolution. Um, I visited twice the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva and both times was more or less literally moved to tears by the colossal enterprise of cooperating humanity, different languages, different nations, all driving towards the same cooperative end of, of producing this, possibly the largest machine ever built, uh, and all designed to, um, to uncover um, the nature of the universe, a merchants of light indeed, and I, I, I didn't think of the phrase at the time, but I was moved to tears by it. I was moved to tears similarly when visiting the um, Mount Palomar Observatory and the feeling that th these instruments had been used to, to gaze out through immense distances and back through immensities of time. Um, I think that the, the scientific enterprise is possibly the, the thing that humanity has the most cause to be to be proud of. Richard Dawkins, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Reads the background, the stories can often be wrong. Um, it sounds as though there was already, a, a, you know, your father's influence would possibly send you in the scientific direction. You're growing up in an interesting area, naturalistically. Mm -hmm. um, but I read that, in fact, you weren't particularly interested in, as, as, a, as a boy in the naturalist side. Well, that's side. true. I mean, when I, was at, um, um, when, when I look at my fellow students who are reading zoology, yeah. if you ask them how most of them got into it, uh, many of them would have been bird watchers or bug hunters or butterfly collectors mm -hmm. or, or, or wildflower kind pressers. Darwin and Wallace types. Uh, yes, Darwin and Wallace types. Com compared with them, I was more interested in the, the sort of questions of existence, the, the contributions that biology can make to, I suppose, philosophy. Uh, it's not that I w was positively anti-natural history. I just wasn't quite so... I'm not, I'm, I'm not a good natural historian, but I'm probably you know, a, bit, a bit above average. But, but I'm far below the average of, of professional zoologists, who are nearly all better naturalists than I am. So, so this intrigues me because you, you were interested in the why questions, which as your lecture last night, you were basically saying, look, we do the how stuff very well. The why stuff, um, that's, that's... No, I think we tricky. do the why stuff pretty well. At least, if anybody does, does the why questions, we do. I mean, I think my main point would be why questions are either Ill illegitimate questions, like what is the color of jealousy? That's an illegitimate question. Um, uh, to the extent that why questions have an answer at all, science is, is going to be the one, the subject that finds them. And certainly theology isn't. I mean, there, there, there aren't any, any rivals to answer why questions. Um, was there some pivotal point that made you decide to go and actually do science at university? Was there a teacher? A... Um, I suppose at the age of about 15 or 16, in the school system which I and I think you were in, yeah. you had to make a, a choice. You, you couldn't both do science and do, say, history. Uh, and uh, I more or less drifted into biology. Um, it was... Uh, I, I wouldn't say I was wildly interested in it. I was sort of... I wasn't that good at school and I, I was sort of more interested in biology than in, than in anything else. And so it was a kind of drifting in, partly perhaps my father's influence. I didn't really become deeply fascinated by it until, ooh, my second year at university. And there was something that... It was the subject itself, I think, um, aided by the tutorial system, which is unique to Oxford and Cambridge, right. where, where you, um, instead of being lectured to and then going to practical classes and sort of having to meet a required standard in, in exams in which it was assumed that there was a body of knowledge that you had to learn. The, the essence of the 
tutorials, at least that I experienced with Oxford tutors, was that you were given an essay each week, which was often on a controversial topic, which you were supposed to uh, come up with a, with a view on, having, having devoted the entire week to going into the library and reading up all the original literature, all the original research papers in the original journals on this topic. So this is a very heady experience for mm -hmm. a 19 year old to be in effect as near, as near to a world authority as you could become um, in a week. <laughs> and you probably ended up knowing more about it than your tutor in certain cases uh -huh. because although he had spent time reading it up, he wasn't so up to date because you'd just been in the library for that week learning it right. up. And not learning it, reading it, and digesting it. Um, sleeping, dreaming it, in, in, in some cases, including mine. Um, so when I came to write the essay, I was kind of temporarily obsessed with this subject. It was coming out of my ears. Um, that's a very unusual e experience. It's totally different from the experience of a student who says, oh, I'm taking biology 213 or whatever it mm -hmm. is, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking genetics, and so I'm learning the requirement to pass the exam in genetics. It wasn't like that at all. It was, it was write an essay on the controversy between Fisher and Wright on, on um, uh, um, genetic drift. Mm -hmm. and, and so you would read the original papers and, and, it, and evaluate it as a scholar. I, I found, um, don't want to sound like we're complaining about the difficulties of the modern system, but but uh, I, I, d I have found in, in talking to people make that argument to you when you when you got into the God business. I mean, what do you know about that? <laughs> well, they did, but I mean, I, I'm less impressed with that because the, because the, although there is a subject called theology, which when you have professors of theology, I mean, there are some professors of theology who do interesting things like studying ancient um, documents. I mean, Hebrew documents and things, and others who study. Um, history of biblical lands, but theology itself, the study of God, the study of the Trinity or the transubstantiation, that seems to me not to be a subject where you can legitimately call yourself an authority. There is nothing there to be an authority on, and therefore I don't feel impressed by the argument when it's, when it's applied to me there. Yeah. Let's come back to that in, in a moment and circle around to it. Can, can we just go back to very quickly um, beginnings, you were, you, your family, was there a scientific oh. religious background? Um, what? Born in? I, my father uh, read botany at Oxford, I read zoology at Oxford, so we had similar educational backgrounds. Uh, he was, still is, um, very keen on nature and wildflowers and things taught my sister and me the, the names of flowers. My mother, too, was knowledgeable about that. I suppose uh, I therefore had a sort of scientific background, not a religious background at home, uh, a religious background at school. I was sent to an ordinary Church of England schools and was made to go to chapel every Sunday and got confirmed when did, did the whole thing as, as, a, as a boy. As, I mean, that's a fairly typically English story because the, and, yeah. and my, my, understand, my memory is that, that um, the requirement for there being RI, as it was known, religious instruction in the schools was in fact part of a suggestion put forward by T.H. Huxley of all people when he was r running the London... I, I wasn't aware of that but I'm yeah. not totally surprised because yeah. uh, it does seem to me to be educationally valuable that children should be taught about religion which I imagine was Huxley's idea. Yeah. Uh, if you teach children about religion, as opposed to teaching them a particular religion, you don't teach them, you shouldn't teach them such and such is true about the world, about God. You should teach them, there are people called Christians who believe this, and there are people called Muslims who believe that, and people called Hindus who believe the other. Um, and the implication then is, and, and you can look them over and make your choice, or, or, or indeed decide to choose none of them. I think that a proper program of education in comparative religion would sound the death knell of religion uh, probably even more surely than a proper education in science, and I'm all for both. One of the questions after your lecture last night, this is the same point, essentially said, look, um, I'm a Christian, I w would like to impart Christian values to my children. 
um, what right do you have to dictate to me that I shouldn't do that? And, and your response was to say, in fact, that you weren't dictating to mm. him, but that you thought that he ought to offer the opportunity to his children. Exactly. To... Yes. I mean, uh, um, it's, what, it's one thing to talk about the rights of a parent to, to teach their children whatever they like, uh, but what about the rights of, of children? Um, we already accept the principle that, that there are certain things parents do not have a right to do to their children. They can't. Um, beat them black and blue, um, um, they can't knock their teeth out, they can't um, be cruel to them, the, the state even steps in and takes children away when that happens. I'm not advocating that in the case of religious indoctrination, but at least that shows that, that we accept the principle that parents don't have an absolute right over their children, and children are people too. They have a right to learn, to be exposed to um, all that humanity has to offer, which includes science. And if there are parents who deliberately uh, deprive their children of the opportunity to learn all the wonderful things we now know about the world, then that is a serious deprivation. I think that's a form of child abuse. And uh, I, I'm not necessarily advocating that the state should step in and force the parents to educate them properly, but um, it, it, it's certainly worth thinking about. Going back to just, uh Childhood. You, you actually grew up in, in Kenya, in Kenya. Well, no. Um, I, I was there for two years, so and then it's not moved exactly to. Growing up no, there. that's right. And then <laughs> moved to Malawi, which was where my that was then Nyasaland, which was where my father's ah. career was, and th so that I do remember, and uh, um, have been back there. That's you know, just sort of further down, and, and it's a similar country, but um, uh, rather poorer, uh, rather well populated. Well, let me check something mm. with you, because one he was going to go with the, the kin selection mm -hmm. idea. We are now 30-some years on, having gone through the sociobiology mm -hmm. phase of E.O. Wilson yes. and so on. And now Ed himself, E.O. Wilson himself, David Sloan Wilson, uh, are espousing a kind of groups, a return to group selection. Um, do, do you want to comment? Does that strike you? I think they're a... just confused. I mean, uh, I mean, it, you, 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 you rightly cite Win, Win Edwards for, for group selection. That was the group selection that we destroyed. Uh, and it, it, various other mechanisms which, which really work at a, at a genetic level. Um, the so-called new group selection is just kin selection, or in some cases reciprocal altruism, under another name, for reasons best known to himself, which I can't understand, D.S. Wilson thinks it's helpful to rephrase it in terms of group selection. How it can be helpful when he's reviving a word which has been debunked and simply grafting that word onto the very thing that did the debunking, namely kin selection and reciprocal altruism and various other things. Uh, it seems to me to be utterly unhelpful, to be totally misleading to students, and deeply, it's deeply regrettable that E.O. Wilson um, should have teamed up with him in this way. Do you think that one of the reasons for this, that the, uh, underpinning some of this, is is a deep revulsion that some people still have at the um, the rather harsh aspects that come to morality and so on? If you're espousing a completely kin selection view, I have too much respect for E.O. Wilson to suggest that he would be motivated by that kind of kind of reasoning. I, I mean, it may be. I, I'm sure that I'm sure you're right for. For, for certain people, but um, science, after all, is science. It, it's, it's the science of what's true. It's the study of, what, of what's true, and it doesn't matter if it's disagreeable. It doesn't actually have to be disagreeable because um, the, the fact is that humans are, in many cases, nice and loving and cooperative, and we, and, and we, we don't have to obey. Uh, we don't have to behave in a, in a ruthless way. I mean, the, the, the main message of the selfish gene, actually, was that genes may be selfish, they have to be selfish. That's sort of almost part of the definition of, of how natural selection works. But in the course of, of selfish genes acting in order to promote their self-interest through the generations, they may very well program altruistic behavior at the level of the individual, um, as I mentioned, kin selection, re reciprocation, and so on. And um, those are robust theories. They work, uh, and um, they can be generalized sort of by the cuckoo principle that, that sometimes um, mistakes are made mm -hmm. so that altruism which originally was selected in, in, in humans during a time when kin relations were very important 
generalize to uh, people in general. So that's why we give money to Oxfam and, and, and feel empathy towards people who are suffering and so on. Um, we, we, we can devise a perfectly good theory which frees us from the need to feel all pessimistic about, uh, about human nature. But even if it didn't free us from the need to be pessimistic about human nature, um, fretting about human nature is no reason to change our science. Science is, is, is the science of, of the truth. I, I noticed, I made some notes last night from the lecture that you gave. Let me just take, take a quick look. You were talking, in fact, about some of the things that we now do are subversions of the original yes. machinery, in a sense, so that um, we have goal subversions, and subversions mm. of parental care mm. would be the, the liking mm. for pets mm. and so on, or subversion yeah. of... Yes. Well, subversion, that's what I meant by the cuckoo principle. Um, sub subversion is, is the way out of feeling pessimistic about all these things. I mean, we are, we are a highly subverted species. We are, uh, we, if we, even, even if our ancestors were selfish and ruthless, I mean, even they didn't have to be because of the um, kin selection, etc. But we are highly subverted, so we actually can be, many of us are, really rather nice. Perhaps I should, before leaving, perhaps before leaving the Ed Wilson thing, I should say, um, I mean, he, he's talking specifically about, about ants, which he, of course, knows better than anybody, um, and is sort of tempted to say um, he wants to reintroduce a kind of group selection, because he's looking comparatively at what it is that led to certain groups of insects becoming eusocial and, and others not, and is saying that um, you can't get a good handle on explaining Welcome to the Science Studio. Uh, we're actually at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography today in La Jolla, California. Um, the Scripps Nirenberg Prize was awarded last night to our guest, Richard Dawkins. Richard is a well-known evolutionary biologist, um, just finished as Charles Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford, and a well-known author, obviously, of books from The Selfish Genes through The Blind Watchmaker to The God Delusion, and his new book, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. But welcome, Richard. Thank you. New book is called? The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. It was supposed to be called Evolution, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Only Game in Town, <laughs> which was a slogan on a T-shirt that somebody sent me, but the publishers wouldn't go for the second part, so it's limited to The Greatest Show on Earth. All right. I mentioned we're at Scripps. Um, the former director of Scripps and the half of the, the prize name that you got, William Nirenberg, Bill Nirenberg, was also a great communicator of science. And I'm just thinking that you're in great company in winning this prize. If you look at the list of the, the folks who got it, um, I'm just checking now. It's uh, E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson. Pretty good list. David yeah. Attenborough. Um, uh, Jane Lovchenko, who's now the administrator of NOAA. Uh, Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, Craig Venter, mm -hmm. um, James Hansen. Mm -hmm. Two climate people in there, incidentally. Uh, and we are at a place where a lot of the original work has been done that contributes to the whole global warming issue. This is slightly a curve for you, but um, only in the sense that global warming is one of the important issues in science and social policy at this point. And we have now an administration where the president has said that um, he wants to restore science to its rightful place on the U.S. agenda, and a leader of the House um, who says that her agenda can be expressed in four words, science, 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 and science. Would you, can we just lead off by some comment on the whole nation, the state of science relationship to policy? I'm delighted that, uh, that we now do have an administration that takes science seriously, treats science with respect, and uh, it's about time. I mean, we've had four years, science has been in the wilderness for, four year, uh, for eight years, indeed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, so that's extremely welcome. On the matter of uh, global warming, and it's obviously an extremely important issue, it's one that's very hard for lay people to evaluate uh, 
It's very complicated, involves complicated model building uh, and lots of different experts in, involved in their different spheres. That does make it hard because it means that to some extent we who are not versed in the details have to take on trust what experts tell us and that's always risky. It's not what scientists like to do I mean, they like to sort of evaluate it for themselves. But inevitably scientists in one field have to say well we trust our colleagues in, the, in other fields to be getting their sums right and doing their modeling right and things. Um, but that does make it a little bit awkward. It, mean, it means that I'm, I'm not being a climatologist. I don't feel able to speak with the same authority that I could speak with in, say, evolutionary biology. Yeah. We, we, we sort of had a conversation about this uh, a few days ago at, in, in Arizona at the Origins Initiative. The, the, this, this dichotomy between, on the one hand, a public that would like to have a definitive answer to things and thinks that, and thinks that that's what science delivers and the reality of science. Um, in communicating in, in your job as um, Simone professor, did you find that that was one of the issues that you had to be constantly... Yeah, yes, it, it, it is difficult. I mean, uh, and, and the way I put it is that I'm, I'm not qualified to tell you anything about physics. Uh, I'm pro probably qualified to interrogate a physicist and to pose interesting questions to a physicist, but I can't speak with any authority on, on physics. And I suppose that a layperson who doesn't know any science at all um, does tend to think, well, I, I need to get an authoritative opinion on it, everything. I need to know, is this true or isn't it true? And they don't take kindly. Politicians don't take kindly uh, to being told, well, it's, well, sir, it's a bit uncertain. Some people think this, some people think that. The evidence isn't yet all in. Um, but the, un unfortunately, that's the reality of the world. Did pick to classes of students recently that one of the things that seems to be missing enormously is history of science. Yes. So there's no context for, for what they're doing. Um, d is that sort of the point you're making as well? Not quite. I mean, it, that's a, that would be another way of making the same point, I, th I think. Uh, but but, but it, it's a different point. I, I'm not one who thinks that for every question you need to go back to the Greeks and, right. and um, you know, start with Aristotle and things. I, I find that nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't, usually doesn't help you very much. Right. So uh, there's a big turning point. You, you go to Berkeley at some point, right? You, you graduate from Oxford. At some point you go to I, Berkeley. I went to Berkeley as a very young assistant professor uh, at the age of about 26. Um, and this was my first job. It was very exciting, uh, totally new place. Um, I mean, you know, something like where we are now. Yeah. And um, intellectually exciting, politically exciting. It was a very, it was a very tempestuous time in American politics. This was the Lyndon Johnson years, this was the Vietnam War protest years, um, and Berkeley was in, in the thick of it. And um, so it was, a, it was a, a, an interesting time, and, and I only stayed there two years and then was, I suppose, lured back to Oxford by a wonderful offer I couldn't refuse. Hmm. How does, how does the selfish, um, the selfish gene is really the thing that's, that you're associated with a great deal, although I think you prefer the book, the book that followed it, The Extended Phenotype, but Selfish Gene came out in 1976. Yes. Um, what was the stimulus for that? Where did you get the idea? What was going well, on? Well, um, my own research wasn't on evolution, but it, my, much of my preoccupation as an undergraduate writing essays had been on evolution, and I never lost that interest. Um, there was a spate of popular books in the, uh, in the 1960s and early 70s uh, which committed what I regarded as the grave fallacy of group selectionism in explaining the very important question of, of altruism, co cooperation, and, the, and how, that, how that evolves. And I wanted to write a book to explain what I thought was the correct interpretation of Darwinian natural selection, the level of the gene. Um, I'd started lecturing on this topic in, in Oxford, actually, before I went to Berkeley. Uh, I stood in for Nico Tinbergen when he went on sabbatical. And I was at that time very excited by the papers of W.D. Hamilton on what's called kin selection, and which kind of became the centerpiece of the selfish gene 10 years later. Um, and so I based several of my lectures to the Oxford students on, on Hamilton. And then when I went to Berkeley, I did the same thing. And um, then went back to Oxford and carried on with my research, which was nothing to do with any of this. Then there was a power strike. There was a, um, a thing called the three-day week, 
which was which was under in the time of Grocer Heath's um, prime ministership. Prime Minister Edward Heath. Yes, right. that's right. Um, and the, at the height of the, of the crisis, um, the, there was um, the electricity was completely cut off for great swathes of time every every week. So I couldn't do my lab research. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, now's the time to write this book that I've been <laughs> um, nurturing. And so I, I wrote, I think, one chapter, which was pretty much the first chapter of The Selfish Gene. In about 1972, um, what presumably one can look up when, when the three-day week was. It might have been 73, yeah. I can't remember. Um, and then the, the strike was over, and the electricity came back on, and so I dropped it and just put it away in a drawer. And then I got a sabbatical leave in 1975, specifically to finish the book. And by that time, there was more than just Hamilton on the scene. There was Trivers, there was Maynard Smith. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I put it into a, what I think was a fairly coherent view of natural selection at the level of the gene, as opposed to the level of the individual, and certainly as opposed to the level of the group. Uh, and um, published it in 1976. Okay, there's a full circle here, and obviously it's getting into too much, too much depth would be, would, would be difficult, but um, I remember Bob Trivers, who I, I think wrote the introduction, the yes. foreword to The Selfish yes. Gene, um, talking to Bob about how he went through this kind of a transformation himself, sitting there trying to figure out whether kin selection, a la Hamilton, yes. or group selection, Vero Wynne Edwards' version of things was the, was the more accurate, and going back and forth, back and forth, mm. finally having a sort of a revelatory experience and deciding that, that 